Hello and welcome to the Overland Journal podcast. I'm your host, Scott Brady, and I am here with a good friend of mine and someone that I admire not only for the products that he produces, but the places that he has traveled in the world. I've got Lance Gillies with me. He is the founder and CEO of Earth Cruiser, and we will talk a little bit about Earth Cruisers today, but we really want to spend some time talking about Lance as a traveler and also the things that he's learned, not only as a traveler, but as a builder of expedition campers that I think will apply to a lot of the listeners. We can glean a lot of insights from someone who has spent um, you know, decades traveling the world and building unique vehicles. And Lance started off in Australia, and he has traveled. He's done some significant expeditions, including one that we're going to spend some time talking about today, crossing uh, Kalimantan in Borneo, uh, sticking within a few degrees of the equator. And that was something that he just recently completed and a very significant adventure in and of itself. So thank you for being on the podcast, Lance. Mate, thanks for having me. <laughs> you must be getting to the bottom of the barrel to get me here. <laughs> no, <laughs> no it, it is it is a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. And, and uh, we first talked when this was 2011 and we, you were you were coming to the U.S. Yep. with Earth Cruiser, mm-hmm. and uh, we we wanted to get a chance for me to get into one of your vehicles, and you arranged for one of your Earth Cruisers to be available for me to drive in Fraser Island and around right. Australia. Yeah. And yeah. I had such an amazing time in that vehicle, and it really it showed me what was possible in a vehicle that was designed for true round the world international travel. And uh, there was a lot that I learned from that because I've driven a lot of different campers and it was unique to see something that was so purpose built for that. Sure. So yeah. very, very, very cool. And, but I think one of the things that makes you so notable in the industry is the fact that you not only build campers, but you also are very well traveled yourself as an individual. And uh, one of the ones that you told me about uh, just a few minutes ago was trying to make it to Cape York in the wet. So t- tell us how that went. Uh, it went really well. I mean, this is a lifetime ago now, but yeah, so it was uh, a uh, just had a little Hilux, nothing exciting, and we just really wanted to. It was a see if you can moment, and uh, sure. I forgot how many creek crossings. I forgot all about that sort of <laughs> stuff. And 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 look, you travelled Australia. I mean, those some of those tracks people use to get the kids to school, right? Sure. So don't be a moron and go and wreck people's tracks. We're very cap- you know, we, we think about that. So, but the the old telegraph track. Um, tried to follow the beach as much as we possibly could. All that sort of stuff was just, it was an adventure. We simply wanted to find out if we could. Uh, it, it was, um, yeah, swim across um, with a winch cable on the other side, all that sort of stuff. Have your mate, because I went with a mate, um, have a mate tie a rope to you just because it, when those rivers start to go, and they really go, the sure. flash floods are really fast. All that. And how many, vehi- how many vehicles did you have? Two. And uh, what, the, uh, what vehicles did the you? The other one do it in? was a uh, not not known here. It was Holden Rodeo, uh, okay. basically a little. Uh, it's kind of a Zuzu Trooper sort yeah, of thing. Sure. Yeah, a little diesel motor. Both are little diesels. Um, it was just it was just fun. It was yeah. it's what to my mind it's supposed to be about. You know, right. The trucks weren't particularly special. I mean, this right. is quite a while ago now. The trucks weren't particularly special. It wasn't about that. It was about just to see if we can. You know, see if you can do some, it. Yeah, you know. Um, you know, we spent some really good times with Aboriginal communities in really remote places when other people don't normally go. Yeah, wonderful you know, people, amazing oh, people. Incredible. You know, you learn something every day. It's just, yeah. again, big part of it for us is, is just doing that. It, it wasn't uh, It wasn't that it was, um, you know, we wanted to be legends. We just, you just, you kind of want to test yourself, uh, but not in a silly way. Right. Only because... It's just fun, and yeah. and you don't forget them. You don't, yeah. you know. I'm a, uh, I'm a big believer in that. You remember the moments, not the years. Mm. And then, and for me, that's a big part of travel. Yeah, it no, really is. No question. And and it's also it adds an element of of excitement when you've got a way to cross this water crossing, but it, mm. it's also filled with crocs. I think there's been a, a lot of Germans that have been consumed by crocodiles in northern yeah. northern Australia. Well, you know, there's a, a just for your listeners, a quick story about crocs. Don't if you're going to go fishing and well, wherever the crocodiles are. I mean, not just in Australia, but quick story. I mean, I'm sure you've been told this is that you never ever go to the same waterhole in the same place three times. Oh, uh, okay. He can see you, and he'll let you come the first time. You go the second time. He goes, all right, now he sized you up. And the yeah. third time, you'll lunch. <laughs> and so it, it's a really – seriously. So Interesting. You don't, ever, don't ever put your swag down the same place three times. Don't do it. Don't do it. Move it. Even if you're the same campsite, move it. Um, 
uh, if you're going to um, uh, go fishing, clearly don't go and clean your fish where you're just standing to be fishing. Oh, don't sure. Ever, you know, if you're going to go fill up your water bottles. all the blood and everything else. Or, yeah. yeah, don't go fill your water bottle. Anyway, but you know, don't go and clean your pots and pans in the th- same place three times. Don't sure. do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Well, and that's it's the same in Africa too. I remember I was I was on a, a friend's farm, big farm near the Kruger, yeah. and it was this beautiful. And it was a hot day, and yeah. it was this. And it, there was a lot of white water and everything. I'm thinking, there's no way there's going to be crocs and stuff up here. And so I get working down a little bit closer to the river, and I start throwing rocks into the into the various pools and stuff. And sure enough, here goes a tail, mm-hmm. <laughs> this giant crocodile. Mm-hmm. And it made me realize, yeah, you know, you just don't do it. You just can't uh, do it. It's, it. it's their world. I mean, yeah. and isn't that another great part of traveling? I love it. You're, you're, you're pulling back a veil into a new exciting place, right? Yeah. I mean, if, if you want to open your eyes to it, if you want to, if you want to stay, you know, if you want to stay in the airport, that's great. But it, I think it's a mental uh, brain snap we have to do. Right. That you go, okay, um, I've landed at new, this new place, wherever it may be, and I'm going to do the very best I can to say hello in whatever language, and I've got to start when I walk off the airplane. Oh, that's great advice. And, and one of the things that I've loved doing is I'll, I'll download a book on the history of the country mm-hmm. that I'm going to go visit. And I also do get a, a small language book as well. Mm-hmm. Usually you can get an app for that for, for whatever language you're, you're going to be encountering. But learning those pleasantries, learning how to say hi, they, oh, kn- they know that you don't speak the language yeah. fluently, but the fact that you've made an effort, yeah. they really respond well to oh, that. Big, and, and I learn, right? I mean, you, 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 whatever, right? You're off the airplane, you're booked into motel, whatever you're going to do. Then, you know, you try and write it out and, and, and it's such an icebreaker yeah. at that first moment. All right. Yeah, for okay. Sure. So I've tried to, I'm going to write it out in a way that I can remember it. And, and, and explaining that to whoever it is, is this the way I say hello in, Mon- in Mongol? Yeah, sure. You've been to Mongolia, haven't you? I have. Yeah. I love Mongolia. Is that I, one of your most favorite places I, to travel? It's, it's one of the most favorite places in the whole wide world to me. And where, where did you travel in Mongolia? Uh, well, you know, you go um, Ubi. So, yeah. you, know, you know, we've got customers there. So to me, it's kind of sort of cheating because yeah. I can just go there. Yeah, and sure. And pick up a truck and drive around, be a carry on. So, but I love Mongolia. Yeah, it's I really beautiful. That north, the northern part of Mongolia. When yeah. I I went from Russia into Mongolia and then crossed the northern tracks, and it was so remote, and it was just so beautiful to be dry. You drive for hours on this perfectly manicured grass, almost, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then oh, here's a beautiful creek. Uh, let's camp here, and then. Mm-hmm. And then the next morning, the locals have are, have ridden up on their camel, their Bactrian camel, or yeah, their yeah. or their horses, or whatever, yeah. and they're interacting with you. Yeah, it was re- it's a really special place. It really is. I, I was lucky enough um, you know, through one of my mates in Mongolia. Um, uh, we went out and visited. So, and I actually didn't know this. So, the, a lot of the sheep are, aren't owned by the shepherds. Oh, okay. I didn't know that. Uh, there's a real hierarchy of who owns the sheep. And the shepherds, I don't think it's a, a proper lease, but there's some sort of I don't know, sure. angri- a, a agreement as to where parts is going to move and as the, as, the, as the seasons go up and down, as they can bring the livestock up and down. Anyway, so story short is that um, we went out to visit some of his friends who were the shepherds um, and uh, we stayed in the uh, – I mean, this is a real family. This wasn't a tourist nothing, sure. right? This is – his friends had just got close enough to where we were that we could reach them in a land cruiser. Amazing. Oh, it was fabulous. And so, it, this might sound a little bit odd, but anyway, so it, it's a big deal. Uh, I got to be the um, the guest of, of the day, and of course I speak no Mongol. Right. Um, and uh, my friends, oh, they're so fabulous. They speak German, they speak Russian. Sure. Yeah, oh, so embarrassing. <laughs> I know. Oh, it's pathetic. Um, so, yeah, so it was, they just went out, grabbed a, one poor sheep, um, and we went from there to have a true Mongol feast wow. and so then other shepherds come in from different places on the little horses and it was fabulous um yeah. it, it, if you again why do you travel because you get to do that yeah those experiences they sear into your oh, memories yeah. I, I i remember i was somewhere in northern mongolia and i came across this family and, and they had their gur and everything mm-hmm. and they they offered me this fermented mare's, oh, yeah. mare's milk oh, yeah. which i was really grateful that they also gave me a 
a vodka shooter because that fermented mare's milk was rough. Yeah. It, was, it was like this yeah. chunky, yeah. you know. I know. It, 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 it was terrible. Oh, yeah. Okay. It was terrible. You, you don't forget. That's yeah. one of those mem- moments you don't yeah. forget, right? Yeah. No, uh, I was wondering. I mean, yeah. I, I'm so glad I did it, but it didn't yeah. taste good. Oh, it was very special. And they told me it's a sensational hangover cure. I oh, really? I can't say that I've experienced yeah. that as a hangover cure, but <laughs> they swear by the stuff. And they're little yeah. kids. They can ride before they can walk. Oh, they're amazing. Yeah. Unbelievable. Isn't it great? They've never lost their skills. Yeah. They've never lost their skills, you know? And here I was riding one of these horses looking like a complete, a complete idiot. <laughs> yeah. And these little kids just go whoosh, straight past yeah. you. It's just too good. Oh, yeah. They're, they're so so talented yeah. at it. I, re- I remember yeah. when I was in, in Tom Tor along the Road of Bones in Russia, mm-hmm. and that was actually one of the northernmost outposts of the Mongol Empire. Mm-hmm. And when the Mongol Empire contracted, they stayed there. And so when you go to that part of Russia, these are Mongolians that mm-hmm. are that are still living there and they have a lot of the Mongol trend you know, traditions that you can still see. So it's really neat to see how far that empire expanded into Asia. Oh, they made it to Baghdad. I mean, yeah. you know, uh, they they went all over Europe. I they mean did. and I've been I get corrected, it is not Genghis Khan, it is Chengis Khan. Yeah. And it's yeah. Anyway, yeah, we learned we learned it it the wrong way, didn't we? Yeah, Yeah, in our schools. Yeah. Yeah, Well, and then you you recently did a trip that looked like it was uh, such a challenge in such a positive way to crossing Kalimantan. Yeah. And tell us tell us about what you did with that journey. How did it get get brought about? Who did you do it with? Okay, no, really good. So I was. Uh, I've been very, very fortunate. I mean, again, I think that's one of the great parts of international travel. You have mates all over the world, right? Right. And so a number of years ago, some friends of mine said, listen, we're thinking about um, doing a a, a trip east to west, uh, following the equator um, across Kalimantan, Borneo. And why are we going to do that? They said, because it's never been done before. I said, well, now that sounds interesting. I'd love to go. If we can pull that together, that'd be terrific. And so, uh, you know, fast forward a couple of years, because imagine it, right? You know, uh, Indonesia is a very modern place and sure. wonderful place. And, um, you know, you've got private land, you've got jungle, jungle, you've got um, some agricultural land. All of that had to be stitched together if we were going to keep the commitment of one degree. And so that took a couple of years. Um, for Just a, logistics. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and permissions and you, and, you tro- and we had to cross... Uh, uh, logging leases and stuff like that, and they just don't let people in. You can sure. imagine how all that would Those natural go. resources are well well guarded. Yeah, yeah big time. I mean, uh, there's a really good book, and it's called The Last Wild Man of Borneo. Okay. It's, and it's a if, if someone would like to get a, a quick glimpse of what uh, Borneo is, it's that's a great book. Oh, good that, suggestion. Yeah, it's really good. And so so anyway, so it, it gives you a, um, a glimpse of how the competing mineral rights, uh, we have environmental, we have... Uh, of course, you know, the logging, and we have all the indigenous tribes, and how, do, how does all that work out on a relatively small area that was once upon a time um, owned, the, you know, that part of the world? I mean, at once upon a time, the um, Bahasa, they, which is a language also, but they, you know, ruled a lot of Asia, mm. you know, in parts of China included, you know, wow. and so you know, there's a lot of deep history there that is not often taught to us. And so, anyway, so story short is, yeah, so we... Literally winched ourselves across. Once. Oh, it was excellent! Fun. Yeah, every every picture you sent me was like thigh deep or or hip deep mud. Yeah. and a yeah. winch line. Exactly. Yeah, and and what vehicles did you use for that? Uh, I had the only Nissan, so I got a little Nissan Patrol shorty. I can't help myself. Um, and so that, uh, we shipped that vehicle over uh, to um, Jakarta. Had some friends there help us um, with some logistics there, which is again, it's that. That, that network community. Sure. You know, it's wonderful. Um, so Justine, he helped us uh, with that. We couldn't get the tires that I wanted. I mean, who, uh, why would anybody be selling jungle tires in Bend, Oregon? Were you right? trying to get Cymex? Or? Uh, no, we didn't. I didn't necessarily want the um, Cymex. I've, the, so we've got the centipedes. I've had them before and I've sure. had the uh, jungle tracker twos before. But um, – it's funny how things change, right? Technology changes all the yeah, time. Sure. You know, the, the centipedes didn't really have enough real side bite. I mean, they're very, very good for going straight. They are not terrific for climbing up the side of a hill. Oh, You've sure. You've got to turn the wheel too much. Got and it. we wanted to basically just – I know it's hard to say on air, but we wanted to sort of climb sideways up hills. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, because, sure. Because there is no road. 
right? There's no lovely wheel tracks to sit in and, and bite. It isn't. So you needed that lateral grip so you didn't time. slide down. Exactly. Yeah. And so now you know, Indonesia's got a booming tyre industry specialising in jungle tyres. So things like that. So um, just What did you end up using for the tyre brand? Do you remember? It's an Indonesian brand. Okay, I'd, sure. Uh, and it worked. Oh, they're fabulous. Oh, they, cool. Uh, we drove around on one completely flat tyre for two days. <laughs> um, just, there was just nowhere to change it. It sure. just wasn't possible. And so yeah, we'll include that in the show notes, the brand that, that yeah, yeah, I'll uh, do that. Sorry. Yeah, I'm pretty, great. No, it's it, good. I, I probably couldn't pronounce the, the Bahasa no, word we'll, we'll, anyway. uh, we'll include it. Yeah. Um, we'll also include some pictures of Lance winching yeah, and yeah, his Nissan patrol. Yeah, and stuff, yeah, so. and, but it's, again, it's the camaraderie. It's the, yeah, you, you go, I, I strongly believe that the jungle never actually wants you to really leave. <laughs> you know, it just, it's, it's going to keep a part of you. It's, it's going to keep a part of you. And, and you, and you start to go into it and, you know, like we left, we, we left the road and it was just a walking track and that was it. There was, wow. and just, we just kept going. And so it was, um, yeah, no, I, I really, the, the jungle never wants to really leave. <laughs> and, but you've got to work together with people. Some people we'd never met before. Sure. And all of a sudden, you know, you're either winching them down something sheer and they are 100% depending on you. And in a few hours or a few days time, it took us best part of a month. Um, a few hours, a few days' time, your life literally depends on them. They are winching you sheer sure. down who knows what. And if they don't know what they're doing, it could be not fabulous. What, what was the high point of that trip? What was that one standout memory or, or, or part of the adventure that was so extreme that, that it really was an earmark? Uh, probably the canoes. We arranged, one of the rivers was just too high to winch across or drive across, and so we arranged for canoes. So we winched the vehicles down onto canoes, um, <laughs> and, uh, and the locals you know, did a really good job of it. Uh, j- they were just canoes. And, sure. And we just put the vehicle, unloaded all the vehicles, um, took all our gear across to the other side. Um, then they paddled. Uh, the canoes across, and then there was a sheer winch straight up. And so, actually, that my kite fell the back canoe. Um, it because we did, uh, we did it at night time. Um, yeah, the exit at night time. And that so the back canoe it sunk, and so the back the back of my car uh, went underwater. And and so it's those it's, it's those moments that you go, you don't panic, yeah. you don't worry, you just do it by the numbers. You hit the winch, you got you you got good gear. You put together the vehicle the way it should be put together and you trust the guy on the other side of it. Yeah. And you just, what else are you going to do? You're going to sit there and scream? You know, no, nobody cares. I mean, <laughs> no. you know, and no, we, it's and not going to get you out of it's that. It's not going to get you out of it, right. Yeah. And we've still got another two weeks of jungling to do yet. So it doesn't matter what happens. You know? And so um, I, I'd say it again and again and again. You build your truck for that moment. Don't build your truck for the moment when it's so nice and sitting in that showroom or so nice and sitting in the mm-hmm. garage, you can sit around and talk about it. Don't build it for that because yeah, that's not where it matters. Yeah, build it for getting out there and doing something interesting. Yeah, at the worst possible time. Yeah, for you know? sure. Um, so anyway, so that so you, you don't forget that one. That was a really good one. And on that same night, so now at, um, where some of our companions on one side of the river, we're on the other side of the river, and um, we'd been camping in the jungle the whole time, blah, 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 wet, Mosquitoes, all How did you stuff. camp? Using hammocks or no, no, no. Uh, um, I uh, again, it's, it's camaraderie. It's kind of what you do it for, you know. Yeah. So yeah, no, just two pe- two vehicles together, uh, winch strap over the top, tighten the winch, and run a tarp over it. Okay, sure. Right? And so it was all bloke trip. There was no ladies on the trip, um, and so yes, we put four stretches underneath there. Stretches are better for flash flood. Um, you're up off the ground a little bit. Sure. You can manage the uh, mosquitoes and snakes and whatever a little bit better than two, and it's just a really good fly net. So very, very simple. Very, very simple. Simple is good. Uh, simple is good. Simple is good. Yeah, simple all is, the, all simple the time. is good. Yeah, yeah. And so that's how we slept. Um, anyway, so we'd been wet for, I don't know, goodness knows how long. Um, and so then there was a, a mosque there, and it's just a really simple, simple the, – there is no road to this little village, nothing like that. Sure. And so there's a very simple mosque there, and um, one of the fellows said in Bahasa, if you – and I don't speak Bahasa um, – you know, if you'd like to sleep in the mosque, you're welcome. And I said, well, are you sure? Because I'm not Muslim. And they said, look, a, a mosque is – this is sign language. A, a mosque is a place of sanctuary. You are most welcome. Uh. And it poured rain that night, and I had the most fabulous night's sleep. <laughs> and 
you got to thought, dry your feet out a little bit yeah, and everything else, sure. Yeah, and I, and, and I guess some people may take an objection to that, but that's okay. I mean, because you're in somebody else's country, and when they offer you such a courtesy, yeah, that's really stunning to me. I, I agree. And you take advantage of that opportunity yeah. to see that side of humanity. And people are just people, right? And and, yeah. and at sunrise, you know, they had morning prayers and they, you know, I tried to stay to the corner and respectful and you don't be, you know, don't bring, take your shoes inside and all that sort of sure. stuff. And uh, it was, yeah, so you asked me the two things of that? Yeah. They're the two things. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And so it took you about a month in total then? Yeah, yeah, it was gone for just a month. Yeah, just a little over a month. Oh, what a what a memory that would be of having that experience. And w- what would you say, um, just kind of more on the technical side of things with the vehicle? So you had a, a short wheelbase Nissan Patrol. Mm-hmm. What were maybe the top three modifications that you did to the vehicle for that trip that really stood out in your mind okay. as making the difference? It, um, all right, so it's clearly a really good quality winch. All right. Yeah. So I had put the Warren H seven four on it. Uh, my truck's twenty four volt by choice, but I put a twelve volt motor on it. The reason is it goes faster with more torque. Okay. And it's a really easy thing to do. Um, so there's that. Uh, making sure that we could carry enough water. Uh, being hydrated is dreadfully important, of course. Oh sure. Uh, we we uh, try and avoid those plastic bottles. The you know we could we can do our little part, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, if we're in a position to put in some decent sized water tanks and water filtrations, which we can, why wouldn't you? Right. Uh, and then uh, decent fuel tank. Right. So the way the, you have the range. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And so as far as um, uh, modifications, I wouldn't say there's a lot of modifications. We could have a look at it if you like. It's it's pretty basic and, and yeah, that's sure. important. Um, but it's make it, I would class it as get outable. Right. So we did burn out uh, a winch motor trying to pull ourselves out of something. And so now we're stuck. Right. The back of the vehicle again is underwater stuck the winch motor doesn't work anymore uh there's no one to pull us out because we were the lead car at that point and we're stuck stuck right now not only are we stuck nobody can get around us sure to do anything right so now right problem and so uh when you pack that winch motor don't put it at the very back where you got to pull everything out (laughs) it's simple things like that that you really got to think about. Seriously, yeah. um, and so you don't. I mean, so think of the things that you are really going to need at the worst possible scenario and put them where you can get them. Yeah, and I've, I've seen people do that with their medical kits. They'll put the mm-hmm. medical kit in the very back of the drawer system or they'll mm-hmm. have it under a pile of, yeah, yeah, when you need it, you need it right yeah. away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, in your, if you've got an ashtray or a console, what you should have there, in my humble opinion, you should have plenty of those little um, sanitary, uh, what do you call it, um, wipes for, sure. uh, what do you call them? Um, like a wet wipe? Exactly. You should, you, they should be there with Band-Aids. Sure. Should be. That, yeah. th- those two things should be there all the time. You should never have to go dig for those because if you can deal with a simple, particularly in a, uh, like a jungle environment, if you can deal with that in the first couple of minutes, it's going to make all the difference in the world. I remember you, uh, one of your recent podcasts, you were talking about getting your, making sure your teeth are uh, yeah. in good nick. That's really smart. Yeah. That is, it sounds silly, but it's not. I mean, it's, it's a case of if you're really, humble opinion, really traveling, that means you're going somewhere and you are not going back to where it was that you were safe. Mm-hmm. You are going to somewhere new now. And so don't, if you can avoid it, don't put yourself in a position where you have to get to somewhere mm. to be safe or to be comfortable. Right. And, 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 and safe means different things to different people. To me, it just means it's, it shouldn't be a forced march. There is no medal for being the most miserable. <laughs> true. You know what I mean? There's yeah, not. so oh, true. You know, look, I have got the whole way with no shoes. Or well, why didn't you buy some shoes? You know, <laughs> yeah, you know so what I true. mean? It's it's yeah. not like that. Yeah. So so simple things that one can prepare for themselves. So okay. So if this got really bad, what is it they want at hand? Mm-hmm. Want some water? You want some food? So whatever bits and pieces you think you might need. So that's it. So, man, I can't, I can't really say that there's a, a laundry list of, um, uh, of things that we did to the vehicle outside of being very um, purposeful on what the vehicle was designed to do. And I think that might be the question you asked me. Yes. Is, yeah. is, is, what, is what is it that we could do to make it so it's going to fit our purpose? Right. And that's what we could do. And, you, you know, it's, it's uh, the Nissan Patrol – 
in the times that I've used them in Africa and in Australia, they're really exceptional vehicles. Is that kind of your wagon of choice? Um, yeah, I, I got. To, I've had a couple of patrols and you know, spoil a little bit. Um, I got a Nissan Patrol GQ Patrol only because there was no other one in the US that I could find. Okay, so that cool. may, to me that makes the most logical thing that I should do, and yeah. I've had them, and, and I know them. Yeah, you know? and they're pretty basic. You know, they're a little TD forty two four point two liter diesel motor, five speed gearbox, four disc brakes, four coils. Yeah, um, so they're no powerhouse, um, but it's but they work. They're yeah, really they work. tough. Yeah, yeah, they're tough. You know, um, on that trip we tore out all of the brake lines, just all the vines, mm-hmm. just destroyed the brake lines. So we did most of the trip with no brakes, um, but. It's got a really good transmission handbrake. You know, thing again, some redundancies of it were built into those things sure. a long time ago that you can take advantage of. Yeah, they're really robust. In fact, I remember when I was crossing one of the big glaciers in Iceland, we were using some 70 series Land Cruisers, and to make them robust enough to take the 44 inch tall tires, they actually put Nissan Patrol axles yeah, underneath yeah. the Land Cruiser. It, yeah, in the when we used to do off road racing, the winch challenges, which are very very similar to. Uh, um, the uh, Camel Trophy, but yeah. under a stopwatch, um, is that we would get, say, 75 series Land Cruiser and cut the axles out of it and put Nissan Patrol under it because yeah. the 75 has a really good vision. The Patrol loses a little bit. It's got a big bonnet. So if you're, if you're going vertical, it's really hard to see. Sure. Um, with the 75, it's much better. So that was a common thing we do, yeah. Uh, take out the 75 axles, um, put Patrol, GQ, uh, a GU under it. Yep. Now you've been involved with the Rainforest Challenge for years. Mm, for um, time. Have you have you competed in that event? Or oh, yeah, a number you, of times. So, yeah, yeah. And and how did how did that go? Um, well, actually, that's how I met Michelle. So okay, I met cool. my wife. Um, so yeah, I guess that makes sense. So yeah, I, I met Michelle and the Rainforest Challenge. She was competing and I was competing. Oh, how cool! Yeah, yeah. And what year was that? That was in ninety seven. Okay, yeah that yeah. that event definitely got a lot of international attention. At at several points because mm. it was so extreme yeah, yeah. and there were even some American teams that, yeah, yeah. that went over and, yeah. and, and tried to be competitive. There was a, uh, was it Eddie Angel out of, yep. out of Alaska? Yeah. Alaska? yeah, yeah I, good guy. I met him yeah. a few times. Interesting yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I know that a lot of them tried to be competitive. Now, did you ever do the, uh, the Outback challenge in Australia? Yep, certainly did. Yeah. yeah that was did that as well. Yeah. That was a good, um, but the, things have, um, seasons, don't they? Yeah, they do. And those have changed for sure. They have, yeah. Um, But it's um, the way vehicles are, I don't know, um, I think sometimes um, Australia, Indonesia, um, Malaysia to a point has a slight, uh, and South Africa for sure, has a slight advantage when it comes to building overland vehicles because they use them all the time. They do. In really difficult situations. You know, they may not be the prettiest, but they're going to get you there and get you going, you know, and that counts. Yeah, there's there's certain amount of practicality that I've seen in the in the Australian and the South African vehicle projects because they really do need them to work in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. So you don't see as many high performance modifications. You see more durability yep. focused modifications. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it, yeah. They may not be the prettiest, but it sure beats a first-class walk. Yeah, and, and for that's sure. Your, and that's your next option. Well, and with all of your travels and the fact that you grew up in Australia, and and which is where the term overlanding actually originated in many ways, what what does overlanding mean to you as a traveler? Mm, um, well, I, I I'm not sure it's got to be necessarily. It, it, it absolutely is not the biggest wall it, wall it wins. It yeah, is absolutely sure. not, in my humble opinion, that uh, I, I'm driving around in something and and uh, you're sort of you're um I'm doing a lot of umming here. For me, a couple of things I try to maybe I could give you an example. Sure. So we were in Senegal. Uh, in our one of our trucks, and we're in Senegal, and so we there's a place in Senegal where they um, it's a habitat for pink flamingos, and so we wanted to go there. Anyway, so it was again very remote, um, but 
Africa. There's a lot of people that live in Africa. Sure. <laughs> right. And so, so anyway, so wherever you stop, you're going to see a ton of people. So the, um, we were driving through this reserve, I guess we'd call it, and this guy stopped and I didn't, we didn't know anybody. It was getting dark and we hadn't figured out where we we're going to stay yet because a couple of places we were going to stop, it just didn't feel right. So we went to somewhere else. Anyway, and there was a ferry that was going to close soon and we're trying to decide should we keep going that night, catch that ferry and go into the Gambia for, and stay in the Gambia or what we we're going to do. We didn't know. So anyway, so we um, uh, got to this reserve and this guy stepped out and he had a sort of a uniform on, which as you know, you've been in Africa, sure. that could mean anything. Right. And, uh, he, and through broken French, it was the toll is 100 euro. 100 euro in Senegal is a lot of money. Right. And I thought. It's a month's wages. It's, it's a lot of money, you know. And I thought, and I said, um, that doesn't seem right. It felt, you know, this guy's really having a go at us. And, uh, and we kept trying to communicate, communicate. And uh, he went off and he got his uh, boss who was, he was the real deal. And he come back, he spoke great English. And I felt terrible because that, and I've not forgotten, because that guy, he was just trying to look after the flamingos and the toll was 100 euro. Mm. All right. And here I was, my first thought were this guy's just trying to rip me off mm. because I had a preconceived idea of what should happen. And I was wrong. And I felt so bad for that guy because for one, he stood his ground, which I really respected, um, very respectfully, but I could see the anger in him because he could see that I was putting him in a box that, and I was 100% wrong. And I wish I could have enough French to say I apologise. I'm yeah. so sorry. And so to answer your question, what is overlanding for me? It, it is um, getting out of, you can say comfort zone, but just for one moment living in somebody else's shoes. Yeah. You know what I mean? You, you've driven through some amazing places yourself. Would I be able to even survive or even thrive and feed a family with what those people could do? More often, not a chance. I'd starve and die. Yeah, you know. But you know what I mean. And and, yeah. and to have a to have a moment, that's to, to me that is everything. Yeah, I had a similar experience in Uganda. I met I met a woman and and uh, she was trying to get her kids to the next town to go to school, which was eighteen kilometers away. Mm -hmm. And I spent some a little bit of time in their village, and and I, I at the end of the day I had this realization that on the day that I work my hardest in my life, I will not work as hard as she does every single day. Mm -hmm. It's a humbling. It's yeah, a, it's a humbling. It was a yeah. real realization for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, and so things like that really matter. I mean, you know, we um, uh, we were in driving around Malaysia, you know, in one of our trucks, having a wonderful time, and um, one of our friends said, "Come back to." Come back to my town, you know, my my uh, my place for dinner. Yes, please. Love Malaysian food. Yeah, and, sure. And so he's got a lovely little eighty series cruiser, and we were I was flat out keeping up with him. He's flew through the back of his little town. It was really quite fun. Anyway, so and I thought to myself, if the truck I had was any bigger, I'd be missing out on dinner right now. Right. You know what I mean? So sure. So there's a, there's two opposites. So what is overlanding to me? It is. Um, being in a position to put yourself in someone else's shoes for just a little while. Yeah, uh, and that I love that. I love that idea. I like that definition in a way because it it gives us something to to aspire to, yeah. is to experience something unique from our own culture, something different from our own life, and we probably learn a lot more about ourselves oh, in that you. way. Oh yeah. well, I know I do. Yeah, um, and. And, and maybe maybe we earn a glimmer of respect from the from the people's country that we're mm. guests in. And sometimes these forget that we're guests in somebody else's country. And you know, go catch a, a local bus. Don't go get on the fancy one. Just go figure out the local one. You'll have a completely different trip. Totally different. Oh yeah, yeah. Michelle and I did that in Vietnam. We just figured out the transit system. They call them a chicken bus for a reason. There's they chicken and <laughs> go, goats and everything on there. It's just wonderful. Yeah, it is it, wonderful. It is wonderful. And the people you meet, you know, and then, yeah, it's great. I mean, Laos and Cambodia, push bikes, local transport, fantastic. Just 
Couldn't recommend it enough. I love. Have you been to Laos? No, I haven't. I'd love, love to Laos. go. Love Laos. Yeah, I haven't spent enough time in Southeast Asia, so yeah. I need I need to do that. Matt has, but I haven't. Yeah, it's relatively well, relatively easy from Australia. I mean, I've spent no time in um, South America, which I really, really, really want to do. Um, be, uh, from Australia, it's just a long, long way away. It is. Um, but Asia, you know, it's much easier. You know, so anyway. It's all good fun. Well, I love your definition. Thank you for sharing that, Lance. That's very cool. Um, one of the things that you do is is run Earth Cruiser, which makes expedition campers that are designed to travel around the world. Um, within the context of someone that's listening, that's interested in buying a camper, what do you what do you think are some of the most important things for them to consider? Uh, again, if their intention is to go see the world by okay. vehicle. Uh, by a camper, what would you have them look for? Um, well, who's I, I'm going to assume the we um, is a husband and wife. Okay, right, sure, okay. probably common, right? Yeah, uh, and so then uh, the world's a big place, but for wherever you want to go, I, I would really work hard at the livability. Livability is could I change a tire? Yeah. Right. Um, livability is, you know, if if I had to be in this vehicle for a long period of time, is there enough separation to make there isn't make sure there isn't a major separation? Huh. Uh, we all need our personal space. Um, if we're going to travel as a group or as individuals, you'll, you'll either way you'll catch up and you will meet people, and you may or may not want to invite them into your what is now your home. And it's funny how vehicles have a way of latching onto us, isn't it? You know, sure. We, they, personality. They do. They really do. So ask yourself, has, that, has this thing got the personality that I'm looking for? And the ultimate question I really think is, am I going to serve it or is it going to serve me? Hmm. My meaning is that am, am, I, am I at a, a – a, level in my own self where am I always going to be worried about this or am I going to be no I this is okay I I can park it wherever I want to park it um, we I can get into tons of details about how things are put together but really who's going to be in charge here am I uh, am I going to be um, the one always worried about this thing because if that's the case no, thank you. Buy a different thing. Yeah, it's not working for you. Whatever that is, sure. You know, and and that's a personal thing to everybody, and that's that's all there is to that. But to me, it is really it's the livability. Who's if you're if if you want to go out and see if you can make vehicle A B C, you know, get around the world, great, knock yourself out. But if you want to go out there and go, I want to go and see and experience as much as I can. You shouldn't be worried about it. Front. Well, and that's interesting because in, when we interviewed Dan Greck, that was one of the things that we asked him, which was what was next for his vehicle. And he says, I need more inside space. I need more livability while he's living on the road. Mm -hmm. And that also came up uh, with Graham Bell, who was another family that spent 10 years traveling around the Isn't world. Isn't that fabulous? Yeah, and a defender. How good, how good yeah, that? He's amazing. Yeah. Amazing family. Yeah, not wrong. Him and Louisa. And... I asked him, you know, what was the most significant modification to his Defender? And he says it was when I put a camper on the back of it. So it's it does seem to be a consistent thread that those that are traveling long term around the world, maybe they start with something like a wagon, but they realize relatively quickly that um, for them to be able to continue to travel around the world and live on live on the road, they need to have a place to retreat to, a place yeah. to live. Again, it's not a forced march. There's yeah. no badge for being miserable. Right. <laughs> it just isn't. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, people yeah. want to talk about the war stories, and yeah, that's, but there's so much more to it than that. There really is. And, yeah. and the war stories don't really come along that often, right? They, oh, yeah. Most of it is that you, you took a, a beautiful hike that day or you interacted with some locals at a market. Yeah. These are, yeah. this, you're living your life just like you would in Bend, Oregon, where we're at now. Um, it's just that they speak a different language, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah. Anyway, so to me, it's so yeah. No, I, I like that. I like that idea of making sure that it's livable for what you need and what your partner needs. That that's at, at that moment in time. Yeah. You know, because it can things, change. It changes. Uh, it's fun, isn't it? Things always change, but we're we're surprised and disappointed when it does. Yeah, yeah. so true. And and I I think about campers for international travel because oftentimes. 
people do aspire towards that. That is definitely something that we see our community aspiring towards is mm -hmm. buying, uh, whether it's a full-size truck and fitting a camper to it or buying a complete camper unit. And if you're considering uh, domestic travel, then you want something that is domestically available and can be domestically serviced and meets the needs, like, for example, in North America, something that can travel at 75 miles an hour down the road, which, of course, your campers do as well. But um, one of the things that I think once you start to consider international travel, there are some attributes that I look for in a camper. First of all, can I put it in a container? Mm -hmm. um, and that's because there are many places in the world where roll-on, roll-off is not available. And you, with roll-on, roll-off, you have a diminished level of security with around your personal effects, um, even though I've not had any issues with roll-on, roll-off myself. But you hear the horror stories of people having issues with roll-on, roll-off. So I think that if I was looking for an international camper, it would be, can I fit it in a container so that it can be secure and shipped out of Magadan mm -hmm. as much as it can be, um, you know, out of uh, Montevideo or wherever, um, and that's that seems to be very effective. And then also, can can the vehicle be serviced in those countries, and can it consume the local fuels? And that leads me to a question uh, about some recent drivetrain changes that you did with your campers, where you've gone to a gasoline V8. Kind of share some of the the philosophy behind that decision and why you're using a gasoline motor now instead of a diesel. Um, sure. Can I just talk about the containerization first? Yeah, of course. Um, very, so, yes. So, um, our, we make a couple of different varieties. One's called the EXP, and that goes into a container. It takes about 15 minutes to do it. And so, yes, we've done that many times. Um, it is very nice having your own stuff. It's it's there. We put all our dry goods, our clothes, etc. It's all in the truck. And so when we pick it up, it's there. And you've already got a million things going on. Did I leave the fridge on at home? Did I leave the iron on? You know what I mean? Did I cancel the newspaper? You've already got a million things going on. So the more you can um, mitigate that, the better off you are. You're going to have a better time faster. Sure. Humble opinion. And so also with the containerization, we don't ever pick the vehicle up from the port. We never do that. Whereas if you've got row, row, typically you have to. You have to, sure. And the reason that we uh, – another reason why containerization may not make obvious sense is that we we um, we have uh, organ uh, agreements with um, shipping companies because we do enough of it. But uh, we, we always pick the vehicle up from a um, bond store. A bond store is the equivalent of the wharf, but it's not run by the government. Why that's important is you know, you're not breaking any rules here, you're not, we're not doing anything wrong – is that the, the wharf is typically a government. And so when if you've got a right or a left-hand drive vehicle and you're in the wrong country, you could you could have that guy who's now responsible for you driving off the wharf and saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to get a permit for before this leaves the wharf. Yeah, sure. That can ruin your day right there. And it just depends on the day, whoever that guy's mood. Yeah. Uh, seriously. Yeah, no, I, I, yeah. I remember the, fir the first time that I shipped vehicles back from the Darien Gap when we went to the Darien Gap and we were in Panama – and I decided I was going to do it all myself because I wanted to learn how it all worked out. Mm -hmm. That was the last time I ever did it all myself. No, after after it. that, you use a customs broker yeah, and, you, and you do you take delivery of the container yeah. out of the port um, in in a in a port bonded facility, yeah. and and then you can cut the lock off yourself. Yeah. You open it up, and they always have some people there to support you, yeah, and, and it makes such a huge difference, massive difference. Because you're right. So at the bond store. Um, there is no federal government person there because it's already been cleared by customs. And right. so, yeah, so you can literally drive it out of that, that yard or workshop, whatever it is, and you're on your way. That's yeah. a big deal. I mean, It does make a difference. Me, that's a big deal. From moving vehicles over to Malaysia and, and stuff, getting caught at the port is not pleasant. Um, so, anyhow, so that's a side thing about no, that's containerization. Great. That's great. Um, and so, yeah, so as far as what's happening in our big wide world right now, it's just reality. It's run by economics, if we like it or not. Uh, ultra low sulfur diesel fuel, we know about that. So some big things that happen now that ships are now going to have to be required to use ULSD. Um, it, diesel, the diesel engines we have now are not the diesel engines we, excuse me, we fell in love with. Things yeah, change. Sure. It makes no sense whatsoever for large um, organisations to spend money on getting those diesels even more compliant um, which and uh, miss the boat on electric. That's just economic suicide. And so 
the the internals of the diesel engines are still very very good. It's all the emission systems that go on the outside to make them difficult, and the um, the decision was taken by um, Fuso, who's owned by Mercedes, which is Daimler, the ones who invented the diesel engine, to discontinue them. Sure. And so that's what's happened. And so um, for the foreseeable future, yeah, we'll be running around on gasoline, which is incredible. Um, and gasoline, I mean, people oftentimes think that that diesel is the most ubiquitous fuel in the world. That's not been my experience because every little village has filled with motorcycles exactly and motorcycles right. don't run on diesel. They run exactly. on gasoline. Exactly right. And uh, I've been able to find gasoline everywhere in the world, even exactly. crossing the Silk Road, which I did in the Suzuki Jimny. It was a gasoline motor. I never once had issue finding gasoline. Exactly right. I mean, there, you know, there's plus minus to everything. Of course, yeah, um, of course. You know, you don't get the range. Sorry, you yeah. don't get the density of, of fuel. Understood. We get all that. Um, a little bit of difference in the safety of the fuel yep. for storage and everything yep. else. One, yeah. one is known as a combustible, the other one's flammable. Yeah. Uh, uh, one's explosive, one's a flammable, right? Yeah. So we get all that. Um, the emission rules didn't disappear. I mean, they're, yeah. they're still incredibly strict, which we have to adhere to, which is fine. We can we can handle all that. But at, at, again, let's go back to the livability part of it. Do you want to be able to insure this thing? Do you want to be able to get this thing serviced? Sure. Do you want it to be such a hodgepodge that you don't know what you actually got? No, that, that's nonsense. You don't want that. And so having it legal, safe, reliable, yes, please. Yeah, I, exactly. Yeah, it's just well, so it's, simple. I look forward to, to driving it, seeing how it how it does. We'll talk well, about that at a future podcast, I'm sure. So. I hope so. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that, that's it's exciting to see what you guys have done throughout the years with an emphasis on international travel. And oftentimes when I look for uh, a camper image in the middle of the road of bones, it's oftentimes an earth cruiser because mm-hmm. it just seems that that those vehicles have been adopted by international travelers as, as something that's very suitable. And, and I believe that a lot of that comes from the fact that the Fuso is an international platform. It, mm-hmm. It's just like a Land Cruiser around the world. They use medium duty trucks, and yep. the Fuso is oftentimes the one that they use for that. Yeah, I mean, again, livability, right? Simple things. You know, if you smash your land, smash your windscreen, um, you could put some plastic up, but are you going to get a good night's sleep? Yeah. No, you're not. You're going to be worried about it all night, right? So, those livability. It's those things that count to us. You know, if you get a flat tire, can you easily get it fixed? Yes, please. You know, stuff like that. It's and so important. You're so right about windshields. People do not think about that when they want to take this really obscure vehicle and drive it around the world. Where are you going to get a windscreen for it? And the, the reality is once you get into the developing world, rock chips and everything else that comes with it. I look forward to um, it. Or, yeah. or, or, a, or a branch or a piece of pipe that comes out of a building yeah. <laughs> any number of things that's going to smash a windshield it happens all the time uh, all all of the time so yeah. being able to replace a windshield is a big deal as, as an example I, I like to use a windshield um windscreen windshield as an example because shipping them is really hard some people yeah. just won't do it yeah yeah because they're so hard to get arrive in one piece exactly they will not take responsibility for it yeah and so that can ruin your trip and again it's not supposed to be a misery right yeah You've got better things to do than worry about stuff like that. Well, you've spent a lot of time in Australia and with Australian manufacturers, and you've used a lot of Australian trailers and campers. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think Australian manufacturing and an Australian mindset brings to something like a camper that's unique? What What are some of the attributes of Australian manufacturing and design that you think adds to? Uh, well, I, I think. Uh, so typical in Australia, we get four to five weeks holiday a year, which is unheard of in sure. a lot of places. Yeah. Right? So, Especially here. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And so that, that actually has a big influence on the product because if you're going to be traveling around the world or traveling around Australia or just going to Fraser Island for two weeks, that camp is going to be sat on your favorite fishing spot on the beach for the next two weeks. Mm-hmm. Right? And so you're going to get a lot of customer feedback. Right. That counts, right? Yeah, sure. That's that's a big thing, you know. Mum, dad, the kids, you know, the mates come over for Barbie and all that sort of stuff. So you're gonna, so the manufacturers have a, a very good direct line to what works, what doesn't. And you've been to the caravan and camping show in Brisbane. Brisbane's roughly a million people, and yeah. the show is eighty five thousand people show up. It is packed. Yeah, and and that's normal, right? And then it's on every year, and so 
it, it's a such a big industry for such a small economy. I mean, more people live in Los Angeles than live in Australia. So, right. so you know, camping is a very it's just ingrained. Everybody does it. Well, I think pretty much everybody. Everybody I know. Um, <laughs> so, so, so I think part of the get right part is just really very. Di- trust me, and it can be direct customer feedback about what's good and what's not. And, it, and that will filter down into the tiny little details of about maybe it's the water pump, maybe it's the fridge. It's not the fridge itself, but it's the little screws that the fridge manufacturer screwed the fridge together with mm. is going to get paid attention to. You know, it's that tiny little detail. So you've got this great inverter that makes 5 million watts. Hey, that's terrific. But if it falls to pieces as you're crossing the Canning stock route, right. I don't care. <laughs> you know, it's a piece of garbage. You know what I mean? And if there's anything in the world that'll cause a vehicle to come apart at the seams, it's Australian corrugations. Oh, yeah, they're great, aren't they? <laughs> it's oh, yeah. incredible. Oh, now, has, has one of your trucks been across the Canning stock? A uh, number of them. Oh, that's cool. That's yeah, such yeah. an amazing route. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It I is. mean, it's it's. Uh, I think it's close to three thousand kilometers mm-hmm. across, mm-hmm. maybe even a little bit more than that. Mm-hmm. That, yeah, that I really enjoyed. I mean, all all of those sand dunes and the just the the little water water holes you find. It was just unbelievable, yeah, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You've spent gone to the Simpson to Halsey Springs or that. Yeah. I haven't done that. No, oh, you not should. That route. No, it's really yeah. really nice. Yeah, yeah. It's great. Anyway, uh, so I think. So for the Australian manufacturers, they get that advantage. And mm-hmm. you, you can't beat experience. You just cannot. You know, you just, you, you, you can't fake experience. Either you have it or you don't. Right. You know, and you can have the best engineers in the world. You can have the, the best. It's not going to help you. You know, you, you've got to spend the time. You've, you just have to. You know? um, you, you've got to know what it's like. You know, you and it's um, that's that's I think the real advantage. So if you want to flip that the opposite way, a huge disadvantage that Australian manufacturers have, in my humble opinion, is that we don't go camping in the snow for two or three weeks at a time. Right. We don't do that. We might go skiing, but that might be only be one or two days. Anybody can get away with one or two days. And so th- that that to me has been interesting. Do you you've seen some of the products that come from Australia? There's a lot of outdoor living space, right. which would last thirty seconds in a big snowstorm. You know? Or even a lot of rain. I mean, Australia just doesn't get a lot of rain. And oh, well, the north it can, but, yeah. but but typically we wouldn't go. We would yeah. go somewhere else. Sure, yeah, you because know, we can. You, you know had what a mean? different direction. Exactly right. You know, and there's a lot of options there, and so I think I think those are a couple of really important things. You know, the the infrastructure is not necessarily there. I mean, the United States is such fabulous infrastructure when it comes to camping. You know, the yeah. the, the it just does. I mean, the beautiful lakes and stuff, which is gorgeous yeah um and a lot of that doesn't exist in australia um that so so the vehicles must by design be more self-sufficient because you may not know where you're going to get your next lot of water Mm. things like that yet they wouldn't uh typically and this is not uh, this is not a black and white thing but typically you know we wouldn't spend a lot of time insulating um water tanks i mean none of the earth cruises we built in australia um, have insulated water tanks, not one of them, because what for? You don't need it. You don't need it. You know, so yeah. why would you carry that? Um, if you're not careful, that can be a more of a problem than a help because all of the spin effects and gets caught up inside some of those things and sure. cause you grief. And so, it, um, like I said, you just got to have the experience. If you ever seen a vehicle burn to the ground for, by spin effects, it takes not very long. Well, I've seen the carcasses yeah. like on the canning stock, exactly right. for example. But yeah. I've yeah, fortunately, I've not had one of my own vehicles burned down but that'd be so scary and and it happens like that yeah incredible and so it's all of that sort of stuff i mean the way the bash plates are made the way you know little cubbies aren't made for things like spinifex Mm. grass could get caught here if you drive around on spinifex grass it's not exactly the same but if you if you drive too much off-road here off off off-road here you get in trouble yeah in australia well you can because there's not a lot of roads you know and so often that's what happens yeah, I, rem- I remember on the canning stock we had to have those special radiator guards because mm-hmm. it was just it was days of driving in spin effects. Yeah, it was incredible. Yeah. It was incredible. It's got a um, it's very oily. Yeah, uh, t- depending on what time of year you go there. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so you can actually melt that down and you can fix your um, jerry cans and stuff with it. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> it's, it's, it's it's it goes as hard as aerodite. It's great. Oh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, when. 
When you look at uh, your library at home or your bookshelf at home, what are some of your favorite books that you that you would oh. recommend that a, tra- a fellow traveler read? Oh, what a fabulous question. Oh, geez, I like that question. This one would probably be a little obscure. Um, I like that. And it is Don't Split the Difference by... Sorry, I can't think of the author's name. It'll come to me. This guy was a hostage negotiator for the FBI. Okay. And that might seem like, hang on, what are you talking about? But it was really just about dealing with people and being able to get, and this guy worked, worked all over the world, you know, in the Middle East and whatever. And, and the book revolves a lot about um, understanding what's really going on in that conversation. What do people really need? Um, really, what say, when someone says something, what did they really actually say? Uh, gotcha. And um, I've read it a number of times now. And um, we were got in a tiny little bit of trouble. Um, you got time for a very quick story? Yeah, let's okay. do it. All right, very quick story. We were in the Sahara. Um, and we uh, just crossed the Sahara, or uh, parts of the Sahara, I should say. Sahara's a big place. Anyway, and um, Michelle said, go that way. I blame her. It's not her fault. It's my fault. She said, go that way. So I went that way and got stuck, all right? So in this, in, in, in our EC, I got stuck. It took me 24 hours to extract it. And uh, anyway, so then got it extracted. We went to, and oh, that's right, I got it extracted. But we thought, and I wasn't sure I was actually going to get it out. I says, no, there's nothing. I mean, we are talking Sahara Desert there. Sure. There's Right, yeah, I did that. Did I've pulled a? I, I've extracted a few vehicles, and I'll say this is probably the hardest one I've ever done. It wouldn't matter what the vehicle was because it's just nothing, nothing. Uh, you're familiar with Max Tracks, I'm sure. Sure. Right. So one wheel turn, one wheel turn. The Max Tracks, you could watch them spear underneath the sand, and you'd see uh, a little, like a little wave. They would, and I have to, and they'd go down maybe two or three feet underneath the sand. The sand was so fine when you walked on it, it went to your knees. And I just come over the top of the sand dune because we've been in the sand dunes for, for a week. Come over the top of the sand dune, come straight down. The truck started to go sideways, so it was right hand top, and just nailed it to get it to go straight again. And uh, it just sunk, boom, straight down, straight, wow. straight to the jazzy rails. And there was nothing around anywhere, right? And, and it was getting early afternoon. So anyway, because it's cool then, so I thought I oh, will pull it out now. And that's when we discovered what was happening with the Max Tracks. So the little tether just snapped because and, – and they call it fish fish or something like that, and it's basically sand water. It's just so fine. I'm no kidding. There's two, still two Max Tracks sitting somewhere there. <laughs> I could never find them again. Wow. And, and they just – it was like they were going through water. True story. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life, ever. I mean, all over Morton Island, Fraser, blah, 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 across the Simpsons, blah, 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 done all that. Nothing pre- prepared me for that. Anyway, so story short, we had a sat phone with us. We are there, you know, now 20 plus hours trying to extract this thing. I thought, this, you know, we were still having a nice meal. We were, uh, everything, all of that was great, living sure. inside. That was terrific. But I was, I was thinking to myself, self, this is not fabulous. Um, and uh, so we had a sat phone and we started to ring to see if someone might be able to just be on the other side of that sand dune so I could winch my way out and I'd be out in five seconds. So we found someone. Um, and uh, they said, uh, kind of weird in a weird way, yeah, we'll meet you. Um, they never did. We got ourselves out, long story short. Um, now, now we've been now it's a full 24 hours, stayed at this little tiny little town somewhere, and went to the John Darmory because we didn't know where we were, just we just need to put everything back and get sorted, you know. Anyway, so we stopped at John Darmory, and they were great, you know, the uh, military place. They let us in, no big deal, no, nothing special. Sliding door closed behind us and we parked the truck in the um, car park. Three o'clock in the morning, it was the Mujahideen. They oh, wow. said, you owe us some money. They had went into the John Darmory, closed the door behind us so we couldn't get out. Wow. And um, that was an interesting conversation. And so they wanted this crazy, crazy amount of money and we said, not going to do that. And so you talk about negotiating skills under pressure. I mean, we didn't have thousands of euro. Sure. Um, and it was, it was a fabulous experience. 
because as through broken English and French, what they really wanted to do was that the way they earn and, and, and uh, provide food for their family is by not by shaking people down, is by rescuing people. Sure. They just thought they could be there in a, two or three days because time means nothing, nothing to them. Right. And once they re- – because they didn't expect us to get out. So it doesn't matter. We'll just – we'll get there when we get there. They got there. We were gone and went, well, this is no good. Everybody knows everybody. You're not going to hide in a place like that. <laughs> And so it was no time at all they found where we are. We weren't, you know, no, we weren't trying to hide. We just didn't know where we what were going to do next. And so story short was that once we understood what is it that you really want, it was, you know, 100 euro or something, which we asked for the service. They sure. didn't preside. That wasn't the point. The point was that we were guests in their country and they absolutely would have provided the service. Sure. But just not on our time frame. Uh-huh. And whose fault's that? Right. You know what I mean? It was great. Love it. Oh, and so that story. So that's and no harm done. Left as friends, all terrific. But you can see how quickly that could go berserk. Right? If you've got half a dozen fellas in their normal, you know, gear, none of them looked happy. They were mad because <laughs> they were being looking for us. <laughs> and um yeah, yeah, you're blurry eyed, what the heck's going on? Stuff like that, you know. So it, it's a skill set, right? And that's why I like that book, is that it, it was um if you if you want to go do something you've never done, if you if you want to, you're going to, to do things differently. You're going to have to do things differently, mm. right? You're going to have to learn different skills, and so that book, I think, is fabulous because it gives a moment of I never would have thought of it that way. Mm. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Totally, and and I think that's one of the things that I love about travel so much is that I am perpetually a student. Because oh, because ev- be. every place every place that I go to I don't know the language I don't know their culture I I don't know anything I'm completely clueless yeah. <laughs> but I'm open minded to learning yeah. Yeah. and I think that that's I think that's one of the things about travel that appeals to me so much is I get to be a student all the time yeah so and it's wonderful yeah. it is wonderful yeah and, so true and um I just have such a great respect for the people. Mm. Yeah. Well, that's a great book suggestion. We'll add that to the show notes. What about as yourself? Well. Come on, you don't get off free. What do you got? Well, I've been I've been reading a couple great books. Um, one of one of the ones that I've been reading a little bit more from the Stoics, and I like that. And given the time frame that we're in right now, uh, a book that I've been reading the last couple of weeks is called "The Obstacle Is the Way," and it does talk a lot about. Um, the, during the Roman Empire, there was actually a plague as well, and the plague lasted for 15 years, and entire legions of Roman soldiers were consumed by it. And um, it, it's just a great book that discusses that the challenges that we experience in our life we're not special. We don't deserve we don't deserve to have a carefree life. That life includes challenge, and it's all about our, how our how we look at the challenges of, from perspective of. We've got to get through it. We've got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. And I think now, at least in the modern age, now is a time for challenge. And it's how we approach those challenges and how we overcome them. And the the attitude that we carry through that and the things that we learn about ourselves, instead of being woe is me or I deserve deserve something, we don't deserve anything. We deserve nothing. Yeah. So um, how we approach those challenges, I think, teaches us a lot. So it's been a good book. Yeah, I, I enjoy it. Yeah, I'd enjoy that too. We we didn't get to choose where we were born. Yeah, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. So yeah, I I um I'm very grateful, incredibly grateful. Yeah. And I, I've got one last question for you. But sure. if if someone was wanting to to get into overlanding and they came up to you at a at an overland expo and they're they're wide eyed and mm-hmm. and uh, they they see this experienced traveler, what would be the first piece of advice that you would give someone that said, "Hey, I'd love to get started with." Overlanding. What should I do first? What would be your first piece of advice? Be be confident in your motivation. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's not airplanes fly every well right now, not all the time, but typically airplanes fly all the time, right? So be confident in your motivation. What what is it? Uh, are you going to be the next fabulous blogger? Are you, yeah. are you going to be uh, the next wonderful uh, con- contributor to? to the journal, what is it that you really want to get out of it? 
you know, start from there and work backwards from there. And then it'll be about vehicles, about where do I go, it's going to be all about, well, what, what are you hoping to get out of this? Yeah, being authentic to yourself. Yeah. Yeah, that's good, good advice. Because I think people, they see a, a vision of maybe a certain type of vehicle or the way that someone travels and they want to emulate that and maybe they miss the mark because they haven't really decided what they want to get out of it themselves. Yeah. I, I strongly believe life isn't a rehearsal. Mm. And so, you know, things happen that if we can do the very best we can to arm ourselves with the best education we can, um, we're a long way ahead. Yeah. You know, and I could talk for hours about vehicles and all the rest of it, and that's great. I mean, it's clearly I love trucks and travel. But, I mean, really, I mean, how many times have you sat around a campfire with someone who's just, they're just really real. Yeah. And it's great, isn't it? You just you learn so much. And, um, you know, when the lights go out for the last time, you want to go, that was good. Yeah, so true. Well, Lance, thank you so much for right, your time. Thank you. I really time. appreciate it. No, I, I enjoyed, enjoyed talking with you today. I learned a lot myself, and, and I think that that is a lesson that comes out of this podcast is for us to all have that mindset of a student so that way we can learn about how to be better travelers and we can learn a little bit about those places that we visit around the world. And I really appreciate your time, Lance, and your your generosity with your time here in beautiful Bend, Oregon. Yeah, it's not bad. Um, yeah, it's not bad at all. And uh, we'll include a bunch of information about the Earth Cruisers in the show notes if someone wants to find out some more about what Lance and his uh, amazing team produces here in in Bend, Oregon, and we'll include some information about his patrol and where he's traveled in the world and, and some links to the books that we've referenced as well. And we thank you all for listening, and we will talk to you next time. Thanks, Mike. Really appreciate it. You're welcome.